Welcome to our 17th Recovery Through Grief podcast. My name is Annie Blue, and today's date is October 1st, 2023. These podcasts are for entertainment education purposes only, to share experiences, views, and stories that can provide new perspectives on recovering through grief. Recovery from loss is achieved by a sequence of small and accurate choices by the griever. Most of us feel limited and without proper insight with which to make those accurate choices. Discovering and completing the emotional pain coming from loss is an intricate trial and initiation of re-education. My next guest, Linda Good McGillis, offers her unique approach and outlook on the emotional cords that interact with the arousal cycles in the nervous system during experiences of loss, grief, and trauma. Linda is part of a society of diverse humans called Profundity Yours. They are coming together now to co-create a new environment of empowered gratitude and heart-based living as one with the earth. Each one of their community contributes wisdom, experience, and limitless perspectives on new ways of being, living, and participating in life. Welcome, Linda. We thank you for taking the time to be here today to offer your perspective on the evolution, harmonization, and integration that comes with grief over time as patience, re-education, and loving connection occurs. Thank you for so much for having me. So I'm just going to give you the floor. I do have questions along the way, but you're just so good about rolling the things that start to come through. So I, I'm just going to give you the floor. You know, grief is is a very powerful emotion. One that we limit ourselves in many ways to to really embrace and, and to really allow it to heal ourselves. And grief will grief will unfold as it needs to. And whether it's our it's our immediate families thank you so much whether it's our immediate families whether it is our friends those close to to our loved one because they're not in the same emotional mental frame of mind as somebody who has experienced a devastation a devastating loss so often they unconsciously or subconsciously put the the individual that is grieving in a space of what is a good way to say it a space of being strong for lack of a better way of putting it and so that makes the grieving process and the loss process so much more challenging and for many much tougher and in those dominating scenario circumstances although the loved ones of of the deceased are trying to be helpful they are actually hindering in many ways the grieving process and and through those situational circumstances the one that is grieving the one that is that has experienced the shock now has to set themselves aside and try to be strong for everybody else even though it's under the guise if you will of of the others trying to be strong for the person that is grieving and and although their intentions are very well what happens so often is it actually rapidly promotes more suffering for the for the for the one that is experiencing the shock and and depending on on what perspective each individual takes you know some people will say there's five stages some will say there's nine stages some will say there's seven stages of grief and for me i'm going to i'm going to actually say it's more like like a 14 step 
space of of of, of recovering from the from the grief you have the initial shock because it's such an abruptness nobody can ever plan for death nobody ever can ever plan that the universe god creator source however they identify the higher power of themselves with can ever determine you're going to go through loss and and because the loss of us as individuals is dependent on our emotional attachments to our loved one that is going to determine the unfolding of the grieving process and yet people are are understanding in the first few weeks but then they go back to their normal life they go back to and the one that is there trying to get through the shock it then has to face the denial the denial within of the identity that they have now lost because of the attachments to their loved one the attachments of the five physical senses of their presence in our in our physicality and the denial as much as it is within us it is also the denial of all of our loved ones after a few weeks they go back to their life they that forces us on into to an unhealthy isolation and denial that we then have to walk through that so for every step of the grieving process there's two steps that have to be taken there's the shock of of the circumstance of of loss and death in and of itself which also brings the shock and death of loved ones of friends of family that was only connected through the loved ones where relationships were formed because of the loved ones and so not only is there the shock and the loss of that there's also in the in the in the denial that please you know they're not gone they're still with me you know how do i how do i live how, how do i go on there's also the denial and the shock of oh god i'm now separated from the others that were connected through us so the grieving and the death process and the loss process process is is threefold because not only are you having the, the shock of the loss of your loved one now you have the shock of all of the relationships that were associated with the loved one and with you as as that coupled of a loved one whether that is a romantic partnership a husband wife whether that is a, a sibling a familial relationship whether that is just a very close friend they are still embraced in your heart as an extended family if you will whether that is your in-laws or or whatever it may be there is more than one loss and so and that first stage of that shock and denial is is going to be about the immediate loss but then there is there's the other side that is going to come back if you will because then you have to embrace the loss that came with the loss of that the effect of it if you will and and that first stage is is a stage of disbelief how do i live without this person i only know myself and and my identity is with this that i that is no longer there and and that can take a very long time and it is also the stage where we are the hardest on ourselves because we're not strong we're crying we're weeping we can't get over the tears we just we can't live without them we can't it's like they can't be gone they you know your whole sense of identity is now challenged and that's the one part that whether it's ourselves that are experienced the shock and the grief and the, and the loss 
or whether it's it's the family and the friends and the loved ones they then too unconsciously subconsciously put the burden of their own shock onto us to be strong and so we never get to really address the very intimate shock and denial that is so necessary because we're trying to be strong and not break down and not not lose control if you will and and that can last for a very short time or a very long time depending on on really truly the intimate heart connection between the two you can be married to somebody for 50 years and yet never form a a, a really deep bond of love more so than the attachment to the idea of the partnership that the that you share and you know that when you start to get over that state of disbelief then you get bombarded with with the secondary half and you go through another phase of shock and and disbelief because now your relationships change let's say it was your your husband or your wife now your relationship changes with the in-laws with those coupled friends that were friends of you as a couple rather than you as the individual and and then there's another state of disbelief that has to come with that so that first phase is is going to probably take the longest to really integrate because not only have you lost your loved one you have lost your identity there is an identity attachment to that friendship that partnership that marriage you know that business partnership wherever the loss is occurring and with that unbearable loss comes the pain and and the pain is going to start coming simultaneously with guilt you know the third and fourth stages if you will and that pain and guilt is unbearable because now you're not only faced with the actuality of this person's not coming back you know before it's just the shock that they're gone now it's the shock and the pain and the anger and, and it begins with the pain of the unbearableness of the loss of the identity that the connection with this person in whatever way the connection was has has now left upon you if you will and you don't know who you are especially you know my grandparents were married for 76 years wow and you know when my grandfather died my grandmother was devastated grant they were elderly don't get me wrong my grandfather was 96 when he died but they had been together so long and they had such a deep connection a deep bond of love for each other that that kind of unbearable loss that identity of of being 76 years with somebody there is such a deep connection that truly your whole identity has been as their wife or their husband or the or you know what i mean and so the pain of losing that identity you don't how are you going to live you just don't know how you're going to make it and that unbearable loss then takes the place of such a a depth of shock to the system and so now it is so unbearable within you how do i survive without this person which is really a sense of loss of identity that now the guilt starts making the lives of others out here unbearable that is the pain that is that is the anger the pain then shifting to guilt which then shifts to the next phase 
which is anger, which is the bargaining. Please, God, please, whatever the higher power is that, that they pray to or connect to or, or believe in, then comes the bargaining you're angry and 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 then you're devastated and then you're angry and then you're devastated and then you're angry and then you're devastated trying to figure out now where do you fit how do you fit how do you live where do you live because now your full force of identity crisis of the loss is now physically right in your hands and this is probably the longest phase and why do I say it's the longest phase? Because this phase doesn't fade away in, and then another stage comes. This phase is an underlying foundation for the next phase of grief. And the next phase of grief, grief is the depression, is the isolation, is the sinking feeling that I, law, I, I died with them. And that's the part of the identity, the isolation, the figuring it out, the, the beginning foundations of acceptance and yet rejection of that acceptance. And, and that's why I say it's probably the longest phase because you can't really separate the third and fourth phases. They go hand in hand with each other. And that is where not only do do we as individuals come into the acceptance that they're not coming back that you can't bargain with the higher power anymore but that brings a very deep loneliness and a very deep depression because who are you now Your whole life has has been attached in one way or another to this bond of love. That how do you how do you go on when a piece of you is missing? Because that's internally how we feel. A large piece of us is missing. How do I go on without this missing piece? And so the loneliness sets in all of the good memories set in this is where everybody the phase where everybody has because your your pain is so unbearable and your your guilt of everything that you didn't do that you should have done and you should have been there and you should have said and and you shouldn't have said this and you shouldn't have did that and and all of the beating up now begins and all of that guilt that lashes out at, at God or a higher power or, 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 or whatever it may be that, that the individual is trying to bargain with to take the pain away. That internal battle becomes the battle out here with their loved ones, with their friends, with this, with that, that are still trying to to be supportive but now get pushed away and and the individual that is experiencing the the deep grief and loss now starts lashing out at, at their loved ones and pushing them away because they feel so guilty at everything that they did or didn't do for their loved ones And that phase of isolation, if you will, of a forced loneliness upon ourselves is really a death process for, our, for ourselves. Learning how to cope, learning how to, to manage on our own without this missing piece, if you will and a missing piece but also that missing piece has created a missing piece and harmony joy whatever it is in our heart and and there is a sense of need to feel that void 
And yet, how do you fill the void? And so this stage where I say is the longest stage of recovery is no different than an addiction, is no different than any other detriment in our life. It is just experienced so much deeper and so much more in depth because the heart is involved versus losing a job. It's not the same kind of grief if you're, if your heart wasn't in it, you know? And so the loneliness sends us into that depressive state of darkness as we surrender that we will never be the same. And that surrendering is a long process because it's directly attached to the identity that you became with the best friend that's no longer there or your sister who who you were so close to or your husband or your wife or your grandparents or what your parents, whatever it may be. And that isolation is going to make you, but before it makes you, it's going to break you. It's going to take you into a self-loathing, a loneliness, and isolation of hopelessness. Which leads us into the next healing phase of grief, which is the death and the birth of ourselves, of the attachments that we had with the loved ones. And, and as we go through, through that death and, and, and birthing process, that is the reinvention, the reconstructing, the putting, slowly putting our, the pieces of our lives back together. And that phase is all about how confident we are. with birthing a new identity, a new you. And let's face it, very few of us are confident in reinventing ourselves. Very few of us are, are fully confident in beginning anew without something or someone. Oh God, would they approve of this? Oh God, would they like this? What would they think of this? And, and that phase is never easy because you're still chasing a ghost of a memory. Yeah. You're still wanting to keep a memory alive that can no longer be kept alive because you have released and made a leap forward. You have released that phase of that identity, you know? And so putting in, and we all have gone through circumstances where whether it was a physical death or, or maybe, you worked a, a job for 30 years and, and now you don't have it. You've retired. It's not just a matter of a physical death. It, it's, it's a death and a loss of a stage of life as well. So we all have gone through these, these phases and we all know that reinventing ourselves, regrouping ourselves, whatever you call it is, is never just a graceful walk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <clears throat> and and what can be such a very challenging detrimental time in our life is actually a, a, a miraculous stage for us for not only our loved ones but who who has passed that we can set free from our entanglement but also to set free ourselves from the guilt of not living up to our own expectations so there is many petals, avenues of loss that occur with grief. And, and unfortunately, as a human society, we look at grief as a very negative thing. And, and as a bad or a sad or a detrimental, rather than seeing it for the liberation of love that it really is. You know, and and recovering from it is never easy. And you know, people say the last stage of grief is, is acceptance. And I'm going to say the last stage of that, that's the second to the last stage of grief. 
you can accept the new identity. You can accept the loss. You can accept, you come into the acceptance rather that they're not going to be there physically to share your life with, but you also come into an acceptance that it's only their physical body, whether that is a conscious or a subconscious acceptance, just because their physical body is not there, that they, they are alive within you. They're alive within your heart, that they're still with you. And, and for many people, they can still connect telepathically, if you will. And, and they come into the acceptance that even though they're not physically there, there's still a part of them that's there. And so they, they now have hope to take the next step. So often it is a sign from them that brings us out of the loneliness, brings us out of the depression, brings us out of the desolation. And it is almost like <clears throat> we are waiting for that permission. We can't go on until we get that sign, that permission of it, of something unseen with, you know, and so the acceptance stage really is more about facing the fear of a new identity of a new place in life, if you will. And with that, it comes the last stage, which is for many hope or what I'm going to say is faith in, in a whole different way, a strength within you have faith that now you are strong enough to go forward and you have hope that you're courageous enough to be able to do it. You know what I mean? And so you begin to look forward to the future or, or what I would refer to more as looking forward to a new beginning, discovering who you are, a new identity and, and the reinvention of yourself, not realizing it began with the shock, you know, and recovering from grief doesn't have to be detrimental. It could be the ultimate love story. And, and how to make it the ultimate love story is, is learning how to honor this is probably going to sound really weird, but honor the shock. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to learn to have the courage in those moments for all the good intentions of the loved ones around us that, that are trying to be supportive. That's where we need to say, look, I need, I need the time alone now instead of, waiting for the third or fourth phase where you're thrown into the depression and the loneliness. You really need that time first with the shock to process it. And unfortunately we don't give ourselves that we wait till it throws us into the depression stage, the loneliness, the isolation, and then we don't know how to handle it. And then the anger and the pain, unbearable pain within us and the guilt, we do lash out at, our, at the loved ones. And it's like, no, you should have did this in the beginning. If you guys had done that, I could have processed. You didn't allow me to. I had to be strong for all of you. You know, the, the hours after it's happened, you're all bombarding me at my house. I have to cook for you. I have to this, I have to that. And, and so a whole nother round that nobody ever talks about now starts happening within the circle of loved ones, which makes the stage of, of grief even more unbearable, if you will. And so the recovering process we make harder than it really needs to be because that's how we have been taught from the very get go of the loss of the shock comes an unhealthy sympathy that unfortunately we as humans have adopted as compassion and empathy. And if we can recognize that we're going more into a sympathy. I'm so sorry for your loss. And then mask it with, oh, well, let's celebrate their life. Those are the two things 
that you really don't want to face right then and there. And yet all, all of the loved ones are, are there. Oh, just remember the good times. Oh, just focus on all the, the, the good times. And that's the last thing you want to focus on because that's going to make the pain even more unbearable. And, and even though we have the best of intentions, it's the one part of the grief stage that we as loving human beings don't take into consideration is in that moment they don't want to think about the good times in that moment they don't want to think about anything in that moment they can't think we're frozen in our shock and the last thing we need is is people oh only think about the good things don't think about the bad times don't think about this don't think about that when the shock's not going to let us think at all we're just going to go through the motions and and in that shock and in in that in the motions we go to our automatic our automated nature of of being and 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 that is taking care of everybody else instead of ourselves and that's probably the biggest the biggest detriment to us when when we we start the recovery process because it starts with the shock. It starts the minute of the loss, if you will. Yeah, and that makes sense. If you notice my, oh, it's beautiful. If, if you notice, I call it recovering through grief because I I look at grief as a portal and a doorway. And I also believe that you, you know, especially in a loving relationship, you the pain is so excruciating because you've got to witness that level and depth of love. You know, you for, some, experience. for some, yeah, you don't, you won't have anything like that. So it's, it's not anything near. And I agree with you that that review process is just a, it's, it's a rough one, man, because everybody does the if onlys and like you said, the bargaining and going back through it. And um, it, 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 we're so tough on that review process. Um, what it, what it, loss isn't just recovery through grief isn't just associated with death mm -hmm. uh, and, oh, yeah. and loss or of, a, of a person you know the recovery of grief can be in so many different ways whether it was an alcoholic who has has leaped to be clean and maintains that for for the addict who who gets off of drugs or or a sex addict or a shopping addict or an emotional eater addiction you go through the phases of of recovery of grief it could be something as simple as as getting your tonsils out mm -hmm. there is still you know the recovery there is still a grieving process of of loss so it's not just a matter of relationships or a person there are so many stages in our life in every moment you live one life, but you die a million deaths during that life. It's not something that is necessarily just the physical loss of a body. And, and if you can look at, at the bigger picture of where we die in and birth ourselves through different ways in, in life in general, getting through the loss and death of a loved one and the shock of that can be so much more beneficial when we we truly are able to step back and look at how much loss, how much grief we have recovered from throughout yeah. our life. Yeah. And, and it will give you the stamina. It will give us the strength to, to handle a more detrimental loss such as a loved one a family member grief is such a deep feeling within us that in many ways if you think about it in many ways we have adopted grief as a huge part of our identity Oh, and it's it's getting it's gonna it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I believe right now with everything we're going through, and I think 
I also witnessed that people, their new identity, identify identification that they create is with the trauma so yes it's interim but it still is it's it's still that attachment to identity you know where it's we believe we need to have that component in order to move through it and i mean totally understandable you know and there you know i can't really say it's a it's a stage of of recovering from grief but a huge part of our grief is adopting a masked persona because of that sense of, of identity loss. Yes. And you go through, and I would say it's through every stage of the recovery process. Um, because you're trying to be all things for everyone but yourself you are trying to escape yourself Mm -hmm. you're trying to escape the pain you're trying to escape the loss of identity and so much of the time you cannot pinpoint what exactly you're trying to escape from other than your mind all of the thoughts the bombardment and because in that stage in those stages of grief your mind never stops it is it is always bringing multitudes of of blame of regret of abandonment of re of of now distrusting you can't trust anything because you've lost this and you had to have done something wrong and and all of the subconscious that plays out that we does don't even realize it is influencing any part of the grief and the loss process there is so much to it and you know as many people have i have worked with and and just the own loss in my life of loved ones of of different aspects of my life i have discovered that it is not only the bombardment of our own grief and our own guilt and our own for everything that we did or didn't do, but there is a lot of subconscious influence that never really presents itself that we recognize. Everybody out here can recognize it because they, they pay the price of the burden of those phases in one way or another, whether that is us pulling away because we're angry that they're that they're trying to be helpful and we're not seeing it as helpful that we'll, you know we get angry that it feels patronizing their sympathy when we don't want their sympathy we don't want their empathy what we really really want is just their physical presence and them not saying a word <laughs> such a hyper such a hypersensitivity it really is where the like i talked about in the beginning those arousal cycles of the nervous system it is so heightened or uh, it's rough and the nervous system is going to be heightened Mm -hmm. it is going to be heightened until that death and birth phase that reconstruction phase because every bit of your identity is attached to five physical senses Mm -hmm. so where people say there's five or seven stages of, of grief really what it is is the reunification oh that's probably not a really good word let me restate that um the unification of acceptance with five physical senses so when you go through the recovering of grief you're going through five deaths simultaneously and then you have the sixth sense which people say is your intuitiveness, but your sixth sense is thought. And that runs wild as you have to deal with the five physical senses. You have hearing, taste, touch, smell, and sight. Five physical senses that if you're talking about recovering from the grief of a job or a loved one or a best friend or a pet or a pet. Yes. 
you have physically touched them and they have physically touched you. Whether that is dad coming up every morning and giving you a hug, mom tucking you in at night, you know, you cuddling with your cat or your dog as you fall asleep, touch. And that is the hardest one to get over. Because, because touch not only touches you physically, but that touch touched your heart. Then you have the, the, the physical sense of hearing. And this isn't one that, that most of us really look at in depth, but you're used to hearing them snore or you're used to hearing them get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You're used to, to smelling coffee when they get up because they always have your coffee ready for you <clears throat> or, or your secretary or, or coworker that would always come in and water your flowers every Tuesday or, or, and you can hear their footstep coming or you can hear their chatter or you can hear their music. And we don't realize how much of an identity attachment that we have to their presence, hearing them in the bathroom, taking a shower. You don't realize just hearing that brings brings a comfort that their presence is with you right. and and then of course you you have the taste you know all the times you the first time you fed each other spaghetti or you know or the first time that you you went to a wine tasting together or the first time you went to Thailand and you, you experienced Thai food together or, you know, whatever it is. So it's, there's so many different parts to, to the recovery process that we don't understand why it takes so flipping long, but it's because in every aspect, whether it's the shock, whether it's, it's the denial, whether it's the anger, the bargaining, the depression, the isolation, acceptance, hope, faith, whatever it is, what stage it is, there has to be a recovery from the five physical senses of the identity you had with the person, the place, the, the job, the experience that now you, you have permanently are suffering and a loss from. And the greater, the greatest to heart is, is sight and touch because sight proves they're with you yeah good point sight proves they're alive sight proves i'm a wife i'm a friend i'm this i'm that but the attachment we have to them the bond we have to them cannot in any way be identified by the five physical senses or the sixth sense of thought. And so you're not going through just one round of grief. You're going through seven. <clears throat> you're going through the physical loss, the loss of touch, the loss of hearing, the loss of taste, the life, the loss of, of um, sight. You're going through the loss of a thought because so much of your thought process took them into consideration. And that's the one thing that we're not taught. We're not just grieving the physical presence. We're grieving the five physical senses and all those cords, all those attachments, all those bonds that we had to them through our whole physicality, not just the presence of their physicality. Well, and the other thing I've looked at too is the imagination factor, because so much of our feeling sensations with others is is really rooted in the imagination, because we, we imagine that this feeling this, yeah. 
and we look at it as imagination rather than a sense a sensory mm -hmm. i mean it just plays such a big role because it is it really that feeling always necessarily or is it an imagined creation that does still connect to that identity that we imagine a framing of it in this certain way it's really interesting to to peruse and look at how much imagination factors into it. But you know, a lot of that guilt and the anger that comes with recovering through grief and loss comes from the fact that you ha now have to face your imagination. Mm -hmm. You now have to come face to face with the person that you conjured them up to be. Yes. Versus the person that they really were. Oh, so often. And, and then you get all the family members and the friends and the coworkers and this, that, who've seen a completely different side of them than you did. Yes. Or a different vibration or a different frequency of them. And, and then the battle begins with them because it doesn't live up to the ideation that you have or had uh, of that person. Right. The thoughts that you have, you know, you could think somebody was, was the greatest person in the world, but maybe their coworkers didn't experience them like that. But they're always going to give their loved ones the best of them versus giving a stranger or a coworker the best of them. And so, again, that's those the senses of our reality are, are dictated by our minds. And you know, you said something that. It's something that I touch on a lot in, in my talk, in my speaking and, and so often our thoughts generate artificial emotions, right? You can That's sit there and you can just be thinking about something and all of a sudden you're angry or you're, you're frustrated or you're hurt just because you were sitting there thinking about something and when you can really step back and observe how much your mind generates artificial tears artificial emotions then you start to see the masks that you put on them and the masks you started putting on yourself and how your imagination made a different story than than what was they may have perceived something different than you did the one that you lost and and again that's part of the filtering of the recovery stages of grief having to face your own unrealistic masks that you put on the relationship or the labels or 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 whatever it may be for you and so often that's why we bargain with god that's why we're angry because we have to face the realization that maybe we put on ugly masks that weren't there maybe we put on two positive masks for them that weren't there in order to survive from our own pain within that we put the burden on the relationship in and of itself to maybe be our savior from why they were here and we numb ourselves to feeling any and unfortunately the, through our family, through our upbringing, through our t teaching, whatever we're taught, society, culture, religions, we adopt and we adapt to a systematic. No, oh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get the right word here a systematic sense of security mm -hmm. in generating emotions rather than feeling feelings. Yeah. And there's such a depth 
of difference between a sensory feeling here, whether that generates sadness, whether that generates frustration, whether that gener generates anxiety, fear, whatever. But we have adapted to many ways of, of pretense. Yes. And in that pretense, we try to be strong. We try to pretend we're all of these these things to ourselves and, and, and to our loved ones. And so you're going through all the grief of that imagination yes. and going through the guilt of, you know, I, I'm, I'm very good at telling everyone relationships don't end because of what we did. It's because of what we don't do. Yeah. The loved ones, we just get fed up. They won't change. They, you know, and no matter how many times you talk to them, you know, they don't change their mind. They don't change their ways. They, these little things that hurt you, they still continue to do because to them, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. And so you also have all of that too on your plate that you, that you have to wade through. And those are the things that get us, get us trapped in a prolonged grieving period. Oh, for sure. And it's, and like, it's so almost the, like a side road. And those are the things that, that take us the hardest to get out of yes. because those are the things that we cry over consistently that keep us looping. Yes. They're not genuine emotions. It is just the memories of the past that are in us thinking about right that generate those artificial tears mm -hmm. and because we generate all that stuff we suppress the true feelings of mm -hmm. the loss that are coming up if that makes sense and really really get into that rotor rooter part so what what do you think the role of balance is in recovering through the grief you know the greatest thing we can do for ourselves is honor and the reason I say honor is honor is something that, that truly we no longer observe. We no longer let it be our way mm -hmm. as, as individuals, as, as countries, as cultures, whatever you want to, we have forgot what honor is. And, and that honor is learning how to honor the feelings inside of us. And instead, we, instead of honoring those feelings and, and the genuineness of them, what we do is we mask our honor to please the circumstances. Always, always putting somebody else before. And else. so instead of honor the, honoring the feeling, we generate a distorted false mask to put on in a disguise of honoring everybody else's grief, if you will. And everybody thinks, oh, well, I lost my father and, and my grief is more important than yours. Yeah, but I was his wife or I was her, her husband and my bond is truly stronger than yours ever will, whether you're her child, whether you're this, or you, whether you're that or, or his, whatever it may be. And we don't take the time to honor the spirit within us. That is truly what is experiencing that loss. It's not your mind that is experiencing the loss. It is your heart that is experiencing the loss. Right. It's physical and sensory. The loss of presence, the loss of their essence, the loss of, of the soul recognition that you shared called a bond of love rather than an attachment to a title that he was my husband or she was my wife or that was my mother or that was my sister. 
or my brother or my dog or my cat there and, and that's the one thing that as as a as a civilization as a society we do not honor within ourselves therefore we cannot honor in the process of anybody else and and the greatest gift we can we can give ourselves and anyone that we know that is grieving is don't give them sympathy they don't want it and you know and, and to be honest that you don't want the sympathy i don't want you have to learn to honor thyself and sometimes that is that truth is gonna hurt the loved ones and everybody else and 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 this is a big thing especially in families is no i'm fine i need you to leave me the hell alone you know instead of sitting here telling me i have to think about the good times or just to think about the good times no i don't want to i want to think about the bad times i want to i want to embrace the, the good as well as the bad you know and, and and even the families and the friends and, and whatever it may be after what seems to be a week or two weeks or a month or two months their bond wasn't as strong as yours was and because their bond wasn't or they weren't with them 24 hours a day or they didn't go to bed with them and wake up with them anymore they think it's just easy to put your big girl panties on put you know just get on with your life and, and put it in the past you can't what? you have to walk through all of those attachments that you had to your experiences together whether those were horrible whether those were the oh my god elvis touched my hand i'm never going to wash my hand again sort of moments whatever it was that you experienced the grief isn't just about the good times it's not about the time at all and that's where we forget in our compassion, in our empathy, in our sympathy that we're trying to offer, we forget something very, very important. That it was never about the physicality. The loss is not about the physicality. That is only a small fraction of it. But the loss is to who we were with them. Because whether they view it as a bad or good. They helped make you. They helped to grow your, your love through that bond, through that cord, through that attachment that they shared together of experience. And so often we make it about the person and where our struggle is, whether we're on this side of the grief or this side of the grief, our struggle is that we don't honor what it really is. I like that word, honor. What and word? it was a bond of love, no matter what the physical presented. Mm -hmm. Even if it was the most abusive relationship in the world, there was a bond of love that was shared because they weren't always abusive. They weren't always oh. addicted. They weren't always this. And the closer you are to that person, the more you actually knew them, they're ugly and they're good. And you have came to love the whole aspect of them, of the whole lot of sides that other people didn't see because it was your connection that you shared. Mm -hmm. And it was a unique bond, regardless if the world didn't understand or not. Yeah. So I'm going to take it a little bit different direction here. How do you feel grief invites us to know and claim ourselves as living human temples of the divine? What a beautiful question. First off, I have to say that. I know. I love it. You know, I'm one of these that say we're, we're all a spark of the divine. Mm -hmm until you choose not to be a spark. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even then, if you choose to not be that spark, you're still that spark of the divine. For sure.
the best thought I can give give on that is you have to learn yourself. And I'm one to say that the darkness is where your light is at. Mm -hmm. That until you go into the depths of that self-hatred, that self-loathing, that depression, that isolation, and grief is the perfect place to do it. Because it's in grief, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's a spiritual journey, whether it's it's dying to your past wounding, whatever it, it may be, that grief is your liberation. That grief is your freedom. That's why it's a portal or a doorway. And it may be labeled grief in, in, in the human physicality, but it is the highest form of love there is because it's the highest form of honor there is. Because when you can honor the shock and the denial, the pain and the grief and the, and the anger and the bargaining, you are honoring every bit of every aspect of your life. Whether it's, a, it's part of your life of your childhood that's, that's there and gone, whether it's the future coming or any relationship, friendship, whatever it is you experience the feeling of grief in any way it will always bring a brighter light for you it will yeah. always bring a paradoxical beginning which is really the conclusion if you will and as crazy as this may sound and there's a lot of people that that can't grasp when i say this you give me grief and darkness before joy and happiness anytime because joy and happiness for us has is the same as grief it is something that is physical but when you go through grief and the honor that grief will bring to thyself within you th that will bring thyself truly more into your heart it is grief that does that because it is only in grief that you will surrender. And unfortunately, that is such a sad thing for me to say. Well, I mean, it's, well it isn't. I mean, we want to frame it as sad just because of our, even our programming is sad, but it's, it's really stepping away as an observer into the bigger picture and really, really just looking at these as life experiences that make us who we are. You know, it's like watching a, something on stage go by you know you're just watching the different acts and it's what we assign it that can really um rock us around a lot so well you know we look at we are so limited by definition so so limited by definition and every every individual is is enslaved by that cult of personality by the definition of what your personality and your character is and each one of those takes us away from the honor of what love is connection and although it may be perceived that grief is such a an ugly process or an, a sad process or, or however it may be perceived. We strive for joy and happiness and yet we don't strive for death. And, and if we would change the connotation of how we look at grief, look at death, honor would come back in so many ways. But grief is what allows you to release everything that is not of thyself. So for me, I think when I go through a, a, a grieving period for whatever it is, 
as crazy as this may sound, it's where I feel the most alive. And so for anyone that is recover, going through the grieving process in, in whatever manner is in there going. And right now in the shift in consciousness that is going on in this world, there is so much death. There is so much loss. There is so much sadness. There is so much debilitating and there is so much grief. But it is only by a limitation of what we define grieving as. That is my next question. I was I was going to ask what are limiting definitions of who we think we are, of how we perceive each other, and what we imagine is possible for our world. Well, that's the, it's what you're talking about. It, we perceive through through definition, through categorization, through you know the five physical senses can can only contain ourselves within those categories within those those limitations within those definitions that we have given to unfortunately to love love is but we give definition to love sex money romance marriage husband wife child this that and the other and the one thing we forget to do is honor the sensory feeling within us that is going to tell you, wait a sec, it's only you that is putting the definition to what this and this feeling is. How do you know, Annie, that grief is not happy? I, it's because somebody told us that those right. feelings that we're going through is called grief. Right. But what about joy i can tell you that you can imagine joy you can visualize what joy means to you you can generate a feeling of what joy is but almost every imagery of joy is freedom is is golden butterfly and roses is your kids is your loved one your partner you're this or that and so when you look at your definition of what happiness is, what joy is, what grief is, you're going to find when you step back objectionably and really look at your life, you've had more moments of grief than you have what your mind defines in, in, in images as joy. And yet, truly, if you step back past that stepping back, you're going to find what you have defined as grieving turned out to be the most miraculous joyful moments of your life when you well, stepped back out of the definition of something is wrong with what i am feeling and going through well that's what's been so neat this has been like a shamanic journey to do these podcasts like i feel extremely blessed and i continue to grow and learn listening to every single person's process and the the one thing that i can share with you is i is the connection because it, it, whatever this is, if there's a common denominator where I just, and maybe it is my feeling of honor. Like I just, it makes me love humanity. It makes me be grateful for the, the journey that these people have witnessed and, and come through and who they are now. And it's just amazing how many are inspired to go out into the world in a greater way reality of service and give from their hearts well you know as a humanity we've been taught that the world is the problem now whether you call it spirit god higher power source creator it, it really doesn't matter but when you when you look we all have been duped if you will by ourselves that this is what has to be focused on. And this is what takes us away from here. And when you take this out of the way, there is not one, whether it's a, it's an African and Native American, whether it's an Indian from India, whether they're from Thailand or Egypt or the United States or Mexico, it doesn't matter. We have all struggled. We have all suffered. 
we all have an emotional body. We all have a mental a thought process body. And yet here, the feeling is all the same. If it's sad here, you have experienced that sensory feeling of sadness. I have experienced it. Every one of us have. We have all in one way or another experienced suffering, loss, happiness, those moments that take your breath away and just raw beauty. And when you can take this away and see with here, you know, I, I tell people all the time, close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Your your heart and soul doesn't see or hear Linda's voice. It hears its own. And if we can approach every moment of our life that way, every person we come into contact with, even if they're just walking by us, and you can just close your eyes to the five physical senses, you will know in every breath the kingdom of God. You will know in every breath that peace and that harmony, because in that moment, the only grief, the only joy, the only happiness is that of us, of one. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to keep in the forefront of our, of our, of our, of our day to day. We have to train ourselves not to see the good. but to embrace the honor of life in and of itself, our breath, because that is where we're all connected. And that is the only place that you can truly offer genuine, authentic honor, empathy, kindness, compassion that is not limited by, by short definitions of what each individual human has attached to it and all the influencing. So you're leading right into my next question. How is it essential for us to be attentive to how the universe is speaking to us and guiding us to restructure our inner and outer lives? Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but you're a perfect person to ask these questions, so. <laughs> okay, read it again for me. Okay. How is it essential for us to be attentive to how the universe is speaking to us and guiding us to restructure our inner and outer lives. The only way you're going to recover, restructure, redefine, reinvent, the attentiveness that you, that each individual one of us needs is to learn to trust the world. It is the world that we have been taught we can't trust when really it's your own individual circle, mostly your family and close friends and, and co-workers in your own little individualized bubbles that have betrayed you, have abandoned you, have rejected you. But because family's thicker than water or blood, whatever the saying is, We don't see that it's those closest to us that are the only ones who have taught us distrust and abandonment, rejection and betrayal. And yet we've been taught to blame you. I, you're a stranger, so therefore I can't touch you. I can't trust you. I can't touch you. I can't be around you. I can't just because, oh God, you might do something to me even though it's only those in our own little individual bubbled circles that have done any harm to us in any way, shape or form not the world. And so when you ask me about the attentiveness, you have to learn to read the world as God's messenger. Yes. Rather than it being about Annie or Linda or Tom, Dick and Harry or, wow. or evil or good or high vibes or low vibes or, or light or dark, the attentiveness that we all need to do is to pay attention to the either or that we operate from and bring it back to it's not either or it's 
simultaneous and and can you truly see the simultaneously simultaneousness of all things can you see this world as the messenger of god this is god's kingdom can you see everything does that mean you're never going to feel anger or sadness or grief of course you are because it's waves in a quantum field of consciousness and and when you realize you're in that quantum field of consciousness with the whole spectrum of light whether you call it evil or whether you call it good out here the world is god's world let it unfold and and pay attention and be attentive to what you give life force energy to in your thought process because it is only you the individual that that puts definition of either or and when we can see all of this as god's messenger oh such a great way to view it unless you see god in all things out here whether you call it evil whether you call it good you're not seeing god at all because god it, the divine is never out of balance not within us and not without us oh. the only imbalance that ever occurs is in the thought process that is fooled by five physical senses and until you learn to see this out here from the eye here not this eye not these two eyes but the eye is here you cannot see past the eye in the sky which is the great mirror that says this is something else rarely few of us see the actual kingdom of god because we push it to the background right if we get so caught up and they're just uh, individual thought process everything that takes us off i mean it's just so easy for us to be taken off the path so what are the subtle or overt changes in our habits of body and mind that grievers and all of us can make so that our daily conduct is in greater alignment with our sacred nature i mean you're really speaking to you know really truly just coming from your heart and and paying attention to everything is just a message of God. But is there anything else? Learn to hear yourself. What you think, what you say, and what you do is all in separation. Until each individual becomes aware that they're all three in separation. Oh. Those with ears to hear themselves are going to hear those that want to see themselves will see only when they start looking at the automation do you know how many people cross their arms and stand like this and don't even realize they're doing it or they stand with their hand on their hips or they sit and they cross their ankles it's an automatic habit just like breathing and that is what we have to come to recognize because we have lived in our thought process for so long that anything that is repeated the whole world sits there Good morning. Oh, how are you? Good morning. How Good, morning. Are you? Good night. Oh. Sleep dreams. It's all repetitiveness. And as long as there is a repetitiveness in your thought process, there is a disconnection between your words and your thoughts. As long as there is a repetitiveness in your thought process, there oh. is an automated habitual aspect behavioral action of free will that you are subconscious to you are not aware of very robotic if people would stop reacting oh you called me a name or oh you're not oh you're not very nice oh you're dark if people would stop reacting to five physical senses and reacting to their sixth sense of thought and close their eyes and say this is a messenger then they can see through here then they can respond from here but unfortunately we've been taught to be emotionally reactive mentally reactive and the mental reactive comes before the emotional reactive yes and so 
to weave your way through life without pain and suffering. You have to develop an absolute trust yes. to hear. Unfortunately, the human world, we have developed an affinity, unconscious affinity, but still an affinity to, to fear. And people, we have a hard time letting go of fear. Oh, I, I, and I call it the fear of the fear. I, I, I see it as people being fearful of fear. Right, but they're fear they're fearful of pain. Mm -hmm. And if they would just learn to label it and define it accurately, they would see. They are addicted to pain. They are fearful of feeling. Because we've numbed that that aspect sensory feeling down. So the greatest fear of all is pain. Because we have adopted a belief system and a mentality that your heart can be broken and your heart can't, only your mind can be broken. And, and so as people, as, as humans, as a, as a human civilization, we have a hard time of letting go of our pain because it's become our stability, our security, our safety blanket, our safety net. And why do we fear letting go of our pain? because we have let it identify be our identity. We have let it be our, our survival skills. And we, we have a hard time letting go of the pain from the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And so it is easier to prefer and, and, and keep in what is known suffering because we can control it. That's what I think. Believe we can control it. I don't know that. So that's the imagination again. We can. We think we can control. It. Right. Right. And, and you can. You you look at somebody that's been in an abusive relationship, and one of the greatest questions we all ask is, "Why do they keep going back to it?" Well, they keep going back to it because they know the signs. Oh God, they're about to go off. Oh God, you know, they have learned the signs. They know how to control the suffering. And so they become safe in it. Whereas you have a woman or, or a gentleman who leave an abusive relationship and, and th that's all they know. So now they're out in the big, bad, scary wolf called the unknown. And the unknown says you can't do it. The unknown is going to trigger every subconscious fear yeah. within you. And most people can't push through that. You know what I mean? They, they fall prey. They take a leap. But because they took a leap, anything that does not match that leap now is going to come full force right in front of them as, and seemingly obstacle to sit there and say, no, you don't want to do this. Huh? And instead of pushing through it, we fall back into knowing suffering because we can control it. You cannot control the unknown. And if people would approach the physical life, the physicality out here as that, no different than learning to trust this in here. Yes. If they would extend the same trust to the unknown out here, this is going to give them a golden road. Oh, I agree. It's gonna navigate them through the double-edged sword of duality. So the attentive really needs to be: Am I thinking, therefore generating, or I am I allowing this intelligence to be? my thinking for me and allow my mind instead to do my thinking, allow my mind to just project the path forward out here. And that is an inversion that is very hard to do. It's 12 inches. <laughs> and it's the longest 12 inches that you will ever walk. Right. Because it's a constant surrendering, a constant death, constant path of grief as you shed that which is not thyself, that which you have adopted 
not knowing you were divine, not remembering you were divine, what, whatever label you need to give it. But your grief is your liberation. If you can it embrace it. It takes you to the cross. Yes. And, and on that cross, you stop crucifying yourself. Um, and you come to understand that the cross is representative of the meeting point of God here. Not to put yourself on it, not to put anybody else on it to crucify them, but to to crucify and release that which you have adopted by definition that has limited you from knowing thyself, if you will. Grief is a very beautiful, miraculous. It is. It is. I mean, I've just been. I'm telling you, it's been such a blessing to just get to and and to learn all the available tracks that people can have, whether it's like a grief support group or whatever. They have really neat ones with pets out there now, and just just the ways that it can bring people together. I saw something at a, a curriculum I was um, watching online, and they showed this man coming up, and he was. They said, "Okay, tell us in your body where you have pain." And he told them, and then there was somebody on each side of them, and then the person that was leading it behind him, and they just touched those parts of his body, and he really, really felt better as a result of it, because it was just that connection. It was just being seen, heard, felt, and no no judgment or anything. They were just being in that present moment to that person, and it was really cool to see how how progressed he came just in that 15 minute moment it's amazing when people can surrender the five physical senses and really tune in to connection and when you realize truly that all are connected then you can really start to cognitively process that every thought that goes through your head is not yours. That your consciousness is not in your body. You don't exist. That your body is in the field of consciousness, which is God's kingdom. And we now have the opportunity to fully pull in the God spark of us, if you will, and become the living way, the living word of God, the living will, rather than the written word that we have to follow, rather than the past memories, which are recorded, written in the Akashic records. And to come from living from from a societal teaching in whatever a category that is religious culture family whatever skin color race whatever it may be to limitlessness yes i guess is, is a better way to say that when you let definitions go you can embrace god you can embrace thyself you can embrace the divine but unfortunately we are railroaded by five physical senses and the attachments to to that and the more people can close their eyes to the physicality as they perceive it. You can feel every bit of every thought in the world being all from the consciousness of the quantum field, that which is spirit, creator, God, the heavenly kingdom, whatever you need to label it as. And when you can feel the connection sensory wise, you don't exist, which means they don't exist. Me doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. Them does. There is nothing but us don't even exist. There is just 
one that exists, the soul. And you come to understand that there's billions of thoughts in your head. And it could be me thinking it, but it seems personal to you, Annie, because it's in your mind. But telepathy is the connection that we are. And so we have such heightened sensory that we have numbed down to to our limited human mind that you have to awaken yourself to 355 sensory senses that have been numbed down through the nervous system. And so the nervous system goes into panic. When it when any part of those limited definitions is challenged, it just panics. So what helps me is every day is from the book, The Sophia Code, I say, Divine Mother of all life, take me to that place deep within your womb where I can know nothing and be reborn and new. And it's, okay, it's, now I'm going to encourage you to, instead of say that, feel it. Become it. Mm-hmm. Well, truthfully, I would say that as I say it every day in that, the more that, that I've done that, the more I am taking it in and feeling it. I think but because if you I didn't have it. sound, if you didn't have right. mm-hmm. the you have no ability to chant those words because you have no five physical senses. How are you going to generate that which you chant. How are you going to know it if you can't chant it? That's a biggie. I mean, based on the, the, the framework we're in. like mm-hmm. to actually... And that's the difference between giving your power to something outside of you that will convince you. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not judging it because we need those tools. Right. Our conscious mind needs them as it comes into harmony and balance with the with the, our subconscious. But now go to the next level to where you don't need any of those tools mm-hmm. because they're all outside of you. And can you pull the sensory? And you want to pull the sensory alive first and bring it into a feeling that you can permeate through every cell in your body. And Just like when, you're when, gonna we know aha, when we get an aha, where we say, oh, I'm getting chills, that kind of same idea. Where yeah. we're, we're, we really are connecting Pull to it. Through every cell in your vessel. And then you will start to know the divine through connection with the five physical senses and thought having no dictation in it then you will know mother and father then you will pull your spiritual and etheric bodies fully into your body the more you practice that because it is strictly electricity which will generate sensory and 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 mastery to where you don't need chanting you don't need meditation you need nothing out here because you have now opened yours and brought out of numbness out of slumber 355 sensory senses that make up everything else but the tunnel vision that you that you have been taught to live by and then you will know the divine and you will become the living word the living way of the Holy Christ spark of the divine that you are. And that is what everybody really wants. You know, it's like cutting your head off and, and living from here down. The five physical senses and the sixth sense of thought is no longer in control of your mental body, nor your emotional body. And when you can do that, you can invert yourself in ways that, that you could never fathom. When you, when you started coming out of numbness or awakening or whatever it, it needs to be labeled as. And that's what you want to do. Yes, we need the chance. Yes, we need, we need the, the self-discipline to get us back to that trust. 
you know, that trust within. And until you have that trust within of the unknown, of the unheard, of the unseen without the five physical senses and, and your thoughts needing logical proof, that is truly when freedom comes. You know, your grief is liberation, but your freedom comes when the five physical senses and thought no longer controls or dictates. Yeah, I call it bringing the formless into form. And surrendering the form into formless. You have to come, become the collective quantum field before you can release the collective quantum field. Mm-hmm. You know? Beautiful. And when so you can become your every step, and I say say that with so much love and tenderness, when grief can become your every step, you allow yourself to live one life and die a million deaths rather than living a million lives and staying in a space of death and loss for millions of years. And that's what we've done. Like leaving ourselves right into a little cubicle. <laughs> There's a, there's a top to hit against, there's the bottom, and there's the sides. And you can't understand why things don't feel different than what they feel. Well, we've had, this has been beautiful. Is there any last thing you want to play? This has been so exquisite. Really, really observe. Are you truly honoring your feelings? Or are you trying to live up to an expectation of honoring others and dishonoring yourself? And it is really important that we each as individuals learn to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Because as long as we're subconsciously or unconsciously dishonoring, pushing away, avoiding, setting aside, suppressing, how we feel not how we think but how we feel we're creating a dishonor which will automatically cause us a subconscious habitual dishonoring out here all around all around so if you can on like really learn to observe and witness are you sacrificing yourself under the pretense of being in service to others, being a good person, being this. And when I say sacrificing self, I'm not talking about giving the shirt off of your back or your last five bucks to somebody or bringing a homeless person off the street. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, are you sacrificing the feelings within you, which we have all been taught to suppress? rather than allowing them to flow. And if you are sacrificing the time that needs to allow to actually feel, why are you dishonoring yourself? And what is it that's behind the sacrificing of thyself, God's spark, whatever you need to call it, for something that is temporary out here? And when we can learn to recognize that, your life will change. And we will bring God, source, spirit, creator, whatever it is you you label it, back into into a civilization that has so desperately lost hold and sight of truly thyself, themselves. Beautiful. In finishing then, wakening up humanity to its part as a sovereign species that is participating in the ascension journey of an interstellar and interuniversal community of beings, known as the one body of Sophia Christ with no small enterprise. As stated by 13moon.com, as we each do the work to establish healthy foundations, we can bring new levels of coherency to our personal and planetary reality. The tones of grief of this year and next year are calling us to be measured, grounded, and methodical. We as individuals 
and as a species are being invited to be now centered, nonlinear, sensitive, intuitive, receptive, adaptable, and to honor the divine feminine and divine masculine forces of nature as they reside within our own beingness. Let us open to be informed by the divine flow of multidimensional purification that is and will continue to pour forth on our, on our planet. Let us accept our individual and collective struggles as our sacred path of awakening. Thank you so much for joining us today, Linda. It has been beautifully informative and revealing in terms of reframing the importance and wisdom within grief's corridors. To those listening to any of these Recovering Through Grief podcast chronicles, only accept what has been shared with these podcasts if you feel the truth of it for yourself. Always open to what your inner self is offering. Thank you so, so very much for having me. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, it's always so profound to do these. I just, I always come away just in a, in a really. Um, it's a miraculous time yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. It just, you know, we're going to go through a lot of devastation and deconstruction, but at the same time, it's simultaneously with a miracle that is going to unfold. Oh. It's going to blow the limited linear human away. Yeah. And. You know, it's not going to be golden butterfly and roses like everybody thinks, but eventually we'll get there. But totally. it is an essence and honor of light that is coming in that that many have not experienced ever, and that for many other of us have not experienced since the very first fall. You know, and it's a beautiful time of gathering. It's a beautiful time of miracles. But again, you have to have the death if you want the birth. Yeah. And there is much beauty in, in the death that can give birth to the miracle of light in a whole different spectrum. So thank yeah. you so very much. Thank you. This has been beautiful, and I appreciate how you went right along with me with, for all my questions today love to write up my questions you have magical questions they're they're really beautiful cool well i hope you have a beautiful rest of your sunday and i wish you much success with all your endeavors thank you the same to you beautiful and thanks for having me on annie it's been wonderful i agree and thanks for your patience oh oh you're, you're totally worth it